guys after subscribing to this channel please make sure that you also press the bell icon so that no notification no new video of mine any educational video is missed by anybody hello and welcome back friends today's topic is anemia and pregnancy and uh, i'd like to just start the topic without much uh, uh, you know introduction because it's a very very lengthy topic and as i go you will understand what kind of questions are expected out of you so let's just start the discussion my patient mrs x aged 28 years housewife by profession wife of mr y driver by profession is a resident of so and so place belonging to the lower middle class by kupu swami's classification is a primary gravida booked patient with lmp so and so uh, making her edd so and so and her current period of gestation as 27 weeks 5 days came to opd with complaint of fe a feeling of easy fatigability since the past 2 weeks Okay, uh, doctor. Just a second. Uh, what are the causes of easy fatigability and generalized weakness in pregnancy? Easy fatigability, generalized weakness usually are uh, mostly by because of three major uh, problems in pregnancy. With advancing pregnancy, this becomes a very normal, genuine problem of patients of easy fatigability and uh, even difficulty to breathe. sometimes difficulty in walking so these are basically also physiological changes in pregnancy but the two most important pathological conditions associated with uh, generalized weakness and easy fatigability are anemia in pregnancy and cardiac disease in pregnancy or cardiac disease in pregnancy okay doctor continue a uh, history of presenting illness patient was apparently all right two weeks back when she started noticing easy fatigability and generalized weakness Uh, previously the patient was managing all household chores by herself without any discomfort but is now complaining of getting tired even after mild work like washing utensils or cooking food which is causing her problems in her day to day life uh, she also complains of discomfort in climbing stairs which is relieved on rest there is no history of uh, wheezing cough uh, chest pain or palpitation okay doctor just how will you grade dyspnea so dyspnea is graded into four categories by nyha classification so grade 1 is uh, no uh, no dyspnea or uh, very mild dyspnea uh, on exertion uh, grade 2 is uh, mild dyspnea but with excessive work uh, grade 3 is uh, moderate to severe dyspnea on uh, exertion and 4 uh, is dyspnea even not on rest so this is called these are the four categories please continue uh <clears throat> patient is uh, also complaining of uh, discomfort in climbing stairs which is relieved on rest there is no history of wheezing cough chest pain or palpitation patient complains of noticing pedal edema since the past one week which decreases a little after rest she gives history of com uh, skipping antenatal medications due to uh, uh, complain of uh, constipation associated and also complains of on and off bleeding pr only associated with uh, episodes of constipation which are rather infrequent but uh, 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 she, it continues it becomes more when she is taking uh, oral iron tablets because of which she has stopped taking and frequently taking them history of recent fever so no history of recent fever bowel bladder habits are normal no history of headache blurring vision or epigastric discomfort there is no history of any hemoptysis hematemesis uh, no history of any melena uh, but or hematuria but only episodes of uh, fresh bleeding pr only after an episode of uh, severe constipation no history of any recurrent uti or chronic infection in pregnancy no history of passage of worms in stool no history of malaria or jaundice in the recent past no history of bleeding disorder uh, previously no history of bleeding pv or spotting pv no history of any leaking per vagina and fetal movements are perceived fine okay so uh, just a minute doctor uh, please justify your negative history all right so i'll start from uh, the beginning uh, first of all the history of wheezing and uh, cough or chest pain palpitations so this is basically giving the two important histories either it is some some congestion in the lung or there is some uh, heart problem which i want to rule out through this negative history of mine and the only symptoms i can ask her because of rest everything will be more into the reports and everything which we do not get in the examination so in, in the symptoms you can ask only a few couple of things where is she having this uh, you know chest discomfort 
wheezing, uh, you know, problem because he's having difficulty in climbing upstairs and that, uh, you know, sets an alarm. You want to rule out any cardiac problem or lung problem. And uh, if, if she's in failure or she's having any cardiac disorder and because of that, again, she's, uh, she's in failure. So how will we know that by episodes of, you know, either uh, cough or wheezing or discomfort in the chest, chest pain, palpitations. These are all uh, suggestive of, uh, you know, not diagnostic, but suggestive of cardiac symptoms. Patient complains of noticing fetal edema since past. Okay, uh, let's go for, further. She gives history of uh, skipping antenatal. That is also fine. Now, I said no history of recent fever in the past. That means all those, uh, you know, chronic infections are a cause of chronic anemia in the pa patient. So I just want to rule out if there is at all. See, one reason is very out there and simple that she's been taking irregularly the iron medications because of the associated problem of constipation every time that she gets, uh, you know, uh, uh, this... Uh, the moment she gets, she takes oral iron, she gets constipation. She, she started inadvertently avoiding iron medication. Or could be because of that she's developed anemia. But at the same time, I also want to rule out if, if there was any chronic or acute loss of iron any time in the pregnancy. So history of recent fever or any any in any illness, history of hemoptysis, hematemesis, melena. That means inadvertent loss of blood has already been taken taking place. Recurrent UTI, another chronic infection in the body. Passage of worms in the stool, the worms, they suck blood uh, almost very low. But yes, it's a chronic form of, you know, uh, ingestion of blood and chronic reason of, uh, uh, you know, decreasing the hemoglobin in the body. So uh, passage of worms in the body. Malaria jaundice known for, you know, decreasing the hemoglobin count. Any bleeding disorder in the family or bleeding disorder in her previously, which she knows, thalassemia, sickle cell, whatever. Bleeding PV and spotting PV on and off if it's happening, which she, though it is a very alarming thing, she would have come back to and given a very positive history. There's no need to elicit this history, but still, since it's, you know, an examination, all these things are expected out of you and you will say it nevertheless. Uh, no history of leaking PV, well, it was asked just because, uh, you know, certain histories are supposed to be asked whenever a patient comes. That is the history of any pain, discomfort, abdomen, bleeding, leaking and fetal movements. This is four very important histories which are always supposed to be asked to any patient who has come to you in the examination no matter whatever the history is so that is the reason why this this negative history was asked okay continue doctor a uh, history of presenting pregnancy first trimester pregnancy was detected in a local clinic after the patient presented with missed periods following which she underwent an ultrasound examination which was found to be normal patient was given some prenatal vitamins which she took irregularly she gives history of another ultrasound done at around three and a half months which also came out normal she gives history of slight nausea and vomiting for, for which she took medicine uh, but it was not severe enough to cause any kind of complications no history of fever and rash no history of extra exposure no history of spotting bleeding pv there was no history of pain lower abdomen and all blood investigations done in the first trimester came out to be normal uh, second trimester, quickening was uh, uh, perceived at five months uh, gestation. This history of taking iron and calcium tablets irregularly. She gives history of constipation. Of <coughs> okay, uh, excuse me, doctor. When should we start giving iron and calcium supplements in pregnancy? What is the prophylaxis dose of iron? When should we stop giving iron supplements? Until what stage should we continue? So, uh, there are two uh, schools of, uh, um, uh, you know, which advocate the giving of uh, iron supplementation in pregnancy. One is the WHO, one is the Ministry of Health and Family Welfare. According to the WHO, the prophylactic dose of, uh, uh, you know, this uh, uh, iron should be at least 60 milligram elemental iron should be given along with 400 micrograms of folic acid and should, it should be started whenever, you know, in the second trimester, whenever the patient comes to you any time in uh, the second trimester and should be continued till at least three months postpartum. Uh, vis a vis what Ministry of Health and Family Welfare says is that these, uh, you know, 100 milligram elemental iron along with 500 micrograms of folic acid should be as a prophylactic dose, should be started at 14 to 16 weeks of uh, pregnancy and should be continued till six months uh, postpartum. So this is the prophylactic dose which is supposed to be given by, as you know, the two most important regulatory authorities. Okay, okay, doctor, what is the therapeutic dose of iron supplements in pregnancy? Uh, the therapeutic dose according to WHO is just the double dose of uh, what we, we were giving as prophylactic dose. That is 120 milligrams of uh, elemental iron along with 400 micrograms of folic acid. And according to Ministry of Fa Health and Family Welfare, it says at least if you're giving you know, one tablet with 
earlier on also it was 100 mg this this time they say one ta instead of one tablet you have start giving two tablets of iron uh, along with uh, you know folic acid 500 micrograms and that should continue to 6 months postpartum and if it's this is only if it's mild anemia if it's moderate anemia which is also according to the definition i'll, I'll tell you later uh, mild anemia that means it's less than uh, 10 uh, but above 7 anything between 4 to 7 is moderate anemia so if it's moderate anemia instead of going for the oral form we should go for uh, injectable form preferably intramuscular iron should be given and along of course a, a supplemented along with 500 micrograms of uh, folic acid to be given uh, you, you know till uh, the, there is a pre prescribed dosage followed by which you can start giving her two tablets a day to maintain that uh, you know level of iron which we have just supplemented Okay, doctor. Uh, can you briefly describe side effects of iron supplementation? Ah, uh, the oral iron has lots of uh, side effects. Like it's not very well tolerated by many females because of the bloating sensation, because of uh, the metallic taste in mouth, because of uh, you know nausea, because of uh, GI gas, you know, upset that it does. Many, most of the patients have constipation because of that. and uh, they uh, usually do not comply very well with oral iron because of uh, these side effects this was about the oral iron side effects as far as injectable iron side effects is concerned uh, yeah one more thing is that it stains the teeth coats the tongue so these are also very uh, you know disturbing side effects uh, but not serious ones as far as intramuscular injection that is in, you know parenteral route of iron is concerned the side effects happen to be in because it's an intramuscular route it obviously the injection is painful it's very hard it, sometimes it's form hematoma if it's not given in the right way that has to be given plus multiple you know injections that are, are to be given like 8 to 10 so again uh, because of this uh, discomfort because of this hematoma formation sometimes even anaphylactic reaction has been seen so um, patients again the compliance is very questionable uh, as a follow up for intramuscular iron uh, getting these two things in, uh, you know iv uh, iron um, sucrose dose has also been uh, now uh, introduced which has got a better compliance first of all because more dose can be given uh, diluted in uh, um, uh, this thing in normal saline we can uh, give it slow and the compliance is pretty good because it does not cause pain or you know hematoma formation can be given slow can be given under guidance you know under the direct vigilance of uh, hospital authorities so iv is much better tolerated plus less number of you know injections are given maybe two to three times iv fluids uh, can be given at an administered patient is there in the hospital so if there's any problem that can also be taken care of at the same time and uh, no you know test dose is usually required that it's that safe but yes in the initial time you can give it very slow and then you go increase the speed so it's usually covered you know in 1 to 2 hours patient can go back home so uh, these were the side effects